Today we're going to talk about curves. I'm going to explain to you how to understand it and how you can use it to improve your photography. Let's go. We're going to talk about how to understand curves and the best way to do that is to first understand histograms. So I'm going to tell you to go watch the video right up here that we did on histograms. Go watch it right now if you haven't because even if you think you understand histograms, it'll be very helpful to know exactly how they're created. I'm going to wait here for you to watch the video. Okay, now that you've come back and watched the video on histograms and you're a histogram pro, we're gonna get into curves. All curves is, is a mathematical transformation. It's basically a lookup table that says, if your input pixel value is this, spit out this value instead. Picture a histogram along the X axis. So you've already seen the histogram video, so you know that the far left side of the graph is refers to your blacks or your shadows, and the far right side of your graph refers to your highlights or the whites, and the center of the graph is your midtones. So Adobe has actually superimposed a histogram over your curves palette so you can sort of understand what parts of your image you're gonna be adjusting. The way I think about it is the x-axis is your input, so that's your original pixel value, and the y-axis is where you want your output to occur. So for example, let's just look at some shades of gray here. And if you watched our tutorial on a histogram, you'll know that we have five pure shades of gray, pure black, pure white and three shades of gray in the middle. You can't really see the superimposed histogram on the curves dialog only because the spikes are so small and skinny, they're actually occurring right on the grid lines. From the left to right, you have your blacks, your shades of gray, and your whites, the same as a histogram works. So the best way to describe how curves works is to just show you visually. We're gonna put a point roughly right in the middle of our curve here at say, roughly 50%. It's 49.8, but close enough. And you'll notice that there's there's two numbers at the top left corner. There's 49.8 and 49.8. Since those two numbers are the same, it's telling me that I'm not making any adjustments to my image. This is sort of the default curve value. But if I slowly drag this point up, you'll see that the only number that changes is the number on the right. What I'm essentially doing is it's telling you that I'm setting my adjustment on 50% gray uh, and it's taking those values and it's brightening it and turning it into 73% gray. So you get an increase in the brightness value of your image. Even though my point corresponds to this sort of middle gray color here, if I undo redo, you can actually see all the other tones change next to it. However, the blacks don't change and the whites don't change. And you can see that how far this curve is above the baseline determines how much change is gonna happen. So if I look over here, we didn't make a point here on the 25% gray, but you can see it's going from about 25% up to about 43%. So it's not as a dramatic change as where our point is, but the tone curve itself makes a gradual change across the entire spectrum. So that's one reason why I like curves is because it makes all your adjustments very natural. So the power of curves lies not in just making one point adjustment. The power of curves is that you can make as many points of adjustment as you want. So we'll use the eyedropper tool here to put a point on our 75% gray, 50% gray, and 25% gray. So now we have control points corresponding to our various shades. These points are stuck on the graph, so theoretically, all the bars in the image can be adjusted independently. Let's adjust our middle gray again. So we're going up and down and you can actually see that on the image, the only bar that's appreciably changing is a center bar. So you can already kind of see how this is a very powerful tool because you can fine tune adjustments based on where they are on your tone curve or where they are in your histogram. Again, we can adjust our brighter gray color here and the fourth bar from the left is the only thing that's adjusting. Uh, we can change our white point, we can bring it down we can't really make it any brighter because it's pure white. Same with the blacks, you can raise the black point up and it's actually now turning gray. And we can put it right next to the 25% gray and now these are the exact same shade. Similarly, we can pull this one down here and we can make our white the exact same shade as the 75% gray. Okay, so we've played around with these shades of gray here, which sort of illustrates a point, but let's try to use curves in a real life example. So we're gonna pull up an underexposed shot of the Millennial Falcon. So we can see here that the shot's very dark. Uh, the histogram is very left shifted and we've got a lot of empty space out here, which is taken up by these bright highlights from the work lights in the back. So the question is why use tone curves when you have these powerful basic sliders here that you can do a lot of work with? The answer is you could use both. Do I recommend using tone curves? exclusively, not necessarily. In real life, I use both in tandem, but I'll show you that you can achieve very similar results with both 
tools. So the first adjustment I would do with this is I would adjust the exposure. So we'd raise the exposure up to a more normal range. So you can do it that way with the exposure tool and you can see now the histograms are not more evenly distributed. Um, but if we undo that, we can actually raise our tone curve and essentially achieve the same thing. We'll add in some exposure here with our slider just to give us a flat curve here. So what about contrast? So what does contrast do? All contrast does is raises your highlights and darkens your shadows. And that makes the image look more contrasty. So if we use the slider here, we can slide it over and you can see your blacks become blacker, your whites become whiter, and it just adds a more punch to the image. This is obviously overdone here, but if I do that adjustment again and you watch the histogram, it essentially stretches your histogram out. So if we were gonna do the same adjustment with curves, we could put a point in our highlights, raise those up, put a point in our shadows, drop those down, and all of a sudden you've got a very contrasty looking image. Your histogram spread out the same way we saw with the contrast slider adjustment. And you can also see the tone curve itself took on this S shape. Other things we can do is we can adjust the whites. We can bring them down, raise them up. We can adjust the blacks, raise them down, raise them up. As far as the whites and the blacks adjustments, if we go down to our tone curve here, we put three dots corresponding to your highlights, your midtones, and your shadows. If we raise the highlights up, bring the highlights down, that's equi equivalent to adjusting your whites down and up. Or you can adjust the blacks up and down. That's the same as adjusting your blacks here, more or less. So you can see that the sliders have a very similar function to the tone curve. The only caveat is that the highlights and shadows, these actually act differently. You can't achieve that with tone curves because they take into consideration uh, adjacent tones in the image. So you can't actually achieve that. What do you use to adjust your image? Should you use the tone curve to adjust your basic tones or should you use the sliders? Well, while the tone curve will give you a little bit more control, I find it's always better to use the basic panel just because it will get you in the ballpark area of where you want to be for your final image. And then I use the tone curves for fine tuning uh, and stylizing the image. So if you reset this image back to the exposure right out of the camera, uh, you can see it's heavily underexposed. If I wanted to fix this in tone curves, I've got to really steepen this up. I've got to raise my midtones a bit. And all of a sudden I've got this distorted, really steep curve that I'm trying to now add contrast to and little tiny adjustments to ruin the whole image. So it's very difficult to get a good fine tuned uh, adjustment when you're trying to superimpose multiple tone curve adjustments uh, in one curve. So what I'll do in this case is, you know, I'll raise my exposure up and bam, that gives you a pretty good image there right out of the, right off the get go. You've got your histogram is more normal looking and now we have this nice stretched out. We're using the whole tone curve itself. Okay, add a little tiny bit of contrast here and voila, there you go. So in summary, I like the tone curve for fine tuning and stylizing. Uh, for my larger adjustments, I'll use the sliders. So while on the topic of contrast, that's really what tone curves is all about. It's, it's creating contrast where it didn't exist before and altering tones. One reason that I don't just use the contrast slider is because it really doesn't give you a whole lot of control. It, it assumes that your image is a nice even distribution and that you want your shadows dropping the same amount as your highlights are being raised. Like really, it's just applying an S-curve that looks just like this, and how far you're sliding the contrast slider is how aggressive this S-curve looks. So let's say I wanna make this helicopter pop here, where there's some shadows here on the, on the nose of the helicopter, and as we come around the side, there's a little bit of uh, brighter tones here. If you actually use the eyedropper tool, you can say, okay, your shadows are pretty dark. So your shadows here are roughly about 6%. I can put another eyedropper point here at the roughly 26%, and so these points on the curve now correspond to these parts of the image. These blacks are already pretty nice and dark, but I can selectively raise the nose of the helicopter and I can center my contrast inflection point right on this, so I'm maximizing the contrast between these two areas. Now the rest of the image is a little bit overexposed, but if I didn't care about the contrast there, I could lower the rest of the image here and make it a bit flatter. And now I've really made the part of this helicopter pop. If I flatten this curve now, I can say, well, maybe what I want to do is I want to really make this concrete look gritty and I want to increase the brightness of this part and decrease the uh, darkness of this tone here. So what I'll do is I'll take my eyedropper tool, pop a spot on the curve there, pop a spot on the curve here. If I make this part of the image darker, now the concrete is getting really contrasty and gritty. Now the rest of my image is really uh, underexposed, so we can raise that up a bit. And this part looks really flat and low contrast, but we've really accentuated the contrast here in the concrete. Another technique that I use for contrast is I'm looking at my histogram here, superimposing my tone curve. So if I again go back to my eyedropper here, we can see a lot of this gray uh, tin roofing in the background here, all the walls of the hangar. They correspond to this spike on the histogram, which is the majority of the tones here. 
If we go over here, we can see there's another spike of um, concrete here, corresponding to this spike on the histogram. And then all your darker tones here correspond to the helicopter. So what I can actually do is I can make multiple S curves in one single image. So I can put a, can put a point right here. And so I raise this a touch here, darken this a touch here. I know that I'm increasing contrast in the helicopter. If I come over here, put a dot here, and then put a dot here, and raise this dot. So I know the spike on the histogram corresponds to the concrete. So now by adjusting this, I'm actually increasing contrast in the concrete. What I've actually done with this wobbly looking funny tone curve is I've optimized contrast in the concrete and I've also optimized contrast here in the helicopter itself. This is control that you can't get with just increasing the, the contrast slider. The reason why I want you guys to understand how tone curves work is because a lot of times these, these tutorials will make adjustments, they'll give an example, and then you'll try to make that adjustment on your images and just do the same curve. But there's no one curve fits all solution. Each curve should be custom to each image. And that's why I feel like using other people's presets or using other people's tone curves is a good starting point. But ultimately, it's not going to work with every image that you have. If you learn how to use the tone curve, you'll be able to make the tone curve work on your image no matter what the image is. I've kind of shown you how the RGB tone curve works, but there's actually a lot more. There's actually a red channel, a green channel and a blue channel. So if you just extrapolate from your knowledge and understanding of how the RGB tone curves work to adjust brightness, all, essentially all it is doing is it's adjusting your red, green, and blue channels in uniform, so it's essentially adjusting brightness. So using the other tone curves in the color channels, you can independently adjust each color channel and do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, you can get cross-processing looks, very custom uh, split-toned looks. So it's a very powerful tool from that respect. We'll get into that though. So first of all, the image itself has a lot of dynamic range and there's a lot of contrast in the image already. So you can see here, the histogram looks like you crank the contrast and your, and your highlights are really bright, your shadows are really dark. It's really tough to um, make this image look good right out of the get-go. We use our eyedropper tool. You can see all of our skin tones and all this information in my face here is, is slammed to the left side of the histogram. Most of all of the highlight information corresponds to the clouds in the sky. And most people would say, okay, if I'm looking at an image, what's more important, the subject of the photo being the, the person's face, or is it gonna be the sky here, which is all blown out? And most people say, okay, we wanna show the subject of this photo is me, so we're going to optimize these images here. What we wanna do is spread out these underexposed tones while maintaining the highlights without them clipping. So if we just crank your exposure up like that, uh, it does a decent amount, but pretty much this all turned all white and just kind of looks bad and, and overexposed a little bit. So let's only adjust the exposure up a touch here just to bring a little bit of brightness back to my face here. And we can do the rest with tones. We wanna to add contrast to my face. So we see here, we're using the same technique we just talked about. You see there's a bright part right here. So we'll add a point on our graph there. There's a dark part here. We'll add a point on our graph here. And what I can actually do is I can actually click and drag directly on my image. And you can see over, it'll change the tone curve automatically. So what you can actually do is you can actually eyedropper here. Okay, let's make this part of the tone, the image brighter. We're gonna decrease the tone here. And all of a sudden we've added contrast to my face. I still think this is all underexposed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a point that corresponds to the shadows here. And I'm just gonna raise this part here to bring back some brightness in my face. And since we've optimized the contrast on my face, you can, so you can see with this adjustment, we're steepening the curve here. So we're adding contrast in this one part of the image. Adding contrast with the default slider here would make all this darker and make only this part of the image brighter. So you really don't have the control, but we can add sort of an asymmetric S curve here. And we can sort of kind of see how this makes an S curve, but we're essentially adding contrast in my face alone. Now what I can do is I say, okay, I want these to be a bit darker because I, I want to de-emphasize how bright the sky is there. So I'm actually gonna change my white point. I'm gonna have no true white. So you can see the histogram here, the uh, spike that corresponds to the highlights is coming down. It looks a little bit grayer in the sky. I can flatten this out a bit more just to maintain some of the, the tones there. And you can already see here, compare before to after. We've actually increased contrast, but we've centered it sort of on my face to optimize it for this particular image. Now, if you guys have seen some of the uh, trends on Instagram, a lot of people sort of have these chalky blacks and these grayish whites. There's no real true black, no real true white. So you raise your black here, and all of a sudden our blacks look a little bit chalky here. You can drop this down a bit more to make the whites look a bit muddier. And all of a sudden you sort of have that old film look that's really hot on Instagram. As you can see on the histogram here, there's no pure blacks, there's no pure whites, and you get sort of this chalky faded film look. But what we've done is since there's an S curve, uh, it maintains contrast in the midtone. So I'll flatten this curve again. We'll do that chalky blacks 
um, grayish whites. And you can see the image looks really crappy because it's low, it's low contrast. But if we add in an S curve, it raises the mid-tone contrast. And that's how you get that really sort of old time film look that you see on Instagram all the time. So we've talked about RGB curves and how it adjusts the exposure and tones in your image. But how can we use that same concept but adjust the color channels? Uh, well, we just basically will go through each color channel. We can make adjustments. So let's start with the basic one point adjustment like we did with the RGB curve. So if I put a control point right in the middle of my red channel and I move it up, if you guess that your image will turn very red, you are right. So we're coming up and my image turns red. If I pull down, what's the opposite of red? Green. So we're gonna get really sort of this cyan-y green color here. These adjustments aren't that useful, just making one point, but they are useful because you can selectively tint your shadows, midtones, or highlights, and you can adjust each of your three color channels independently. So if we go to green again, put a point in the middle, it gets greener, pull it down, it gets really magenta. Go to your blue channel, raising the blue channel goes, makes the image more blue, drop in the blue channel makes the image more yellow. So I'll take you through an example of sort of one of my go-to techniques for how I stylize some of my images. Um, I really like to tint my shadows with a kind of a cyan -y, uh, blue color. I find that that really makes a good complementary tone with the with the skin tones and sort of gives you a complementary color scheme. It's sort of uh, akin to the teal orange color grade if you're familiar with video grading. Um, so the first thing I'll do is go to my red channel and generally speaking I'll make control points for my highlights, my midtones, and my shadows. Um, in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my eyedropper tool and I know that my I want my skin tones to stay roughly the same. I don't want them to be adjusted too much so I'll put a point on the brighter parts of my skin, put another point up here on the even brighter parts, and then I'll put a point down here corresponding sort of to the uh, darker uh, parts of my skin. So now that I've got three points on my tone curve, so those will essentially stay static. They're pinned to the graph and they shouldn't be adjusted too much. So now what I can do is I can actually drag all the tones darker than that down. You can see how it tints the shadows a really sort of acidy color. It kind of has an abrupt um, change here because of this tone curve. So if I get rid of the, my shadow point here, kind of drop the shadows and make them just sort of this icy blue color. It's a little bit extreme here. It has a little bit too much green in it. What we'll do is we'll go to our green channel. We'll do the same thing. We'll pin our skin tones and then we'll drop the green out of the shadows. All right, so if you kind of want to see the effect of adjusting the red and green channel, we can go to our history. We can go back to just when we had our RGB tone curves on. So now I can undo, redo, Here's with the tone adjustment, and here's without the color tone adjustment. But now that we've sucked some of the green out of the shadows, we can add a little bit more uh, cyan to the shadows here. And it's starting to affect my skin tones a little bit too much there, so we'll pull that control point down. It's a little bit aggressive. It kinda, I think less is more in a lot of these situations. Okay, so we've adjusted the shadows there, and now what I can do is I can go to my blue channel and do a similar adjustment. So what I like to do in this case, is again, we're gonna pin our skin tones, pin them there, and we can do is we can, if you kinda wanna get sort of a pseudo chalky black, we can just raise the black point in our blue tone curve. You can see it kinda gives that sort of tinted shadow effect where the shadows turn a little bit blue. If you wanna warm up the highlights, we can subtract a bit of blue out of the highlights here. You can see how that creates just that sort of warmness outside in the highlights, uh, our reds, and add a little bit of red to the highlights just to make it a little bit warmer. Go back to our blues, subtract a bit more blue out, add a bit of warmth to the highlights. And you can see now, let's uh, go back and undo, redo to our color adjustments. Unaffected image, and now we've stylized it, add this sort of cross-processed effect. It shadows look really dark, the highlights are a little bit warm. Um, if this is the style you're into, then great. Not everybody's into the style, but you know this is just kind of a, a two minute edit just to kind of illustrate uh, the power that you can have with tone curves. So if you just want to experiment, you know, and, you, and you're just getting used to using tone curves, why don't you just try putting highlights, midtones, and shadow points, uh, three dots on each of the lines, roughly uh, equivalent in distance, and you can see, oh, I'll just adjust my shadows, or I'll just adjust my highlights, and see how it changes your image. And really thinking in, color channels is it takes a bit of practice you got to think okay if I want to add cyan that means I have to subtract red or if I want to add yellow that means I have to subtract blue or if I want to add magenta it means I have to subtract green so you kind of have to know what colors you're trying to adjust and then which color channel you have to go to and whether you have to move up or down on it so it takes a little bit of practice okay so that's how tone curves work we talked a little bit about the theory behind them and essentially how they're just a mathematical transformation we showed you how the RGB tone can be used to change the exposure and contrast in your image and we independently adjusted the RGB channels to show you how you can do some pretty cool split 
Tony effects. So if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell so you get notified when we post new videos. We'll see you on the next one. Bye. And do we have a standard outro? The same one. Okay, Vicky. Do you want to get some chicken wings? Did you sneak up on me? Like I sneak up on you. <laughs> do that one. <laughs> what do you think about chicken wings? Uh, I could definitely get some chicken wings. <laughs> when in Buffalo.